Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us back together. Um, we ask that you would once again abide with us through the presence of your Holy Spirit and your angels, and that you would continue to develop these truths for us that we might understand what's taking place in our personal experience and among your people here on planet Earth at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> This is number six, and uh, this is the conclusion of the first section of a study where we are dealing with how Jesus portrays the end from the beginning. And uh, in Adventism, by and large, if we have any um, position on who the Lion of the tribe of Judah is, uh, well, not the Lion and Tribe of Judah, but what the book is that the Lion of the Tribe of Judah takes from God the Father in Revelation chapter 5. If you look at the Adventist Bible commentary, they suggest it's a history book. And it is that, but if you want to get accurate to it, it's, it's not a history book. The Bible is what is in the hand of God the Father, that is, and the Bible is sealed with seven seals, and Jesus, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, takes the Bible and begins to unseal it. And it's when you understand this, you understand who it is that unsealed the book of Daniel in the Millerite time period, and then you understand who it is that unseals the message of the seven thunders here at the end of the world. So we're going we're gonna to look at that in closing out um, this study of what has been and what will be in the Millerite time period and the time period of the 144,000 try to come to grips with the fact that it is Christ that is accomplishing these things. So in page 62, sermon number 6, the Christ the Lion of the tribe of Judah. All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel. And thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony of that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events, which we must know as we stand on the threshold of their fulfillment. What are the great and solemn events? You know, Sister White uses this phrase, great and solemn events. You can type it into the CD-ROM and you'll see that she, the, she uses it in a, a few different ways. This is probably the most provocative one in the sense that it's saying you and I must know these great and solemn events when we stand on the threshold of their fulfillment. And I've asked literally hundreds of Seventh-day Adventists, what are the great and solemn events that we must know? And generally the answer is silence. We must know these things as we stand on the threshold of their fulfillment in a Seventh-day Adventist. We don't know what the great and solemn events are. You know what the great and solemn events are? In Great Controversy, Sister White says, the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble have been clearly revealed, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. The events that you, uh, solemn events that we are to know as we stand on the threshold of their fulfillment are the events connected with the close of probation. And where are the events connected with the close of probation most clearly revealed? Where is the close of probation most clearly revealed? Daniel 12.1. So what are the events connected with that? What are the events that lead up to Daniel 12.1? Daniel 11 verses 40 to 45 are the events, the great and solemn events that we must know as we stand on the threshold of their fulfillment. Um, next quote, a wonderful connection is here seen between the universe of heaven and this world. The things revealed to Daniel were afterward complemented by the revelation made to John on the Isle of Patmos. These two books should be carefully perused. Twice Daniel inquired, how long shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for thy words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tri tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. 
It was the lion of the tribe of Judah who unsealed the book and gave to John the revelation of what should be in the last days. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to our world. These matters are of infinite importance in these last days. But while many shall be purified and made white and tried, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. Sister White just spoke about the Millerite time period and emphasized that Christ unsealed and empowered the book of Daniel on August the 11th, 1840, and she talked about the purification process that took place in this history and says this is of an infinite importance to those of us that live at the end of the world, and then she points forward to a, a repeat of this purification process. So what we're looking at today is Daniel stood in his lot here. The message of Daniel was empowered here. And it all happened by the book of Daniel being unsealed by Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So at the end of the world, when the message that's going to get unsealed is unsealed, who is it that unseals it? Christ. So, brothers and sisters, when you're getting confronted this weekend with the fact that there is a, a truth in the book of Revelation that was sealed up, but the book of Revelation says just before human probation closes that it is to be unsealed, and what we've been sharing is real simple to understand. That part's simple to understand. Seven thunders were sealed up. Seven thunders represent the, these events of 1840 to 1844, but they represent future events. That was easy to follow, right? That logic. But it was sealed up, and there comes a point in time in Revelation 22 where it says, the time is at hand. Unseal the prophecy in the book of Daniel that's been sealed up. And suddenly you're seeing the connection between those verses, right? That's easy to see. It means the lion of the tribe of Judah right now is doing what he does just before human probation closes. That's, that's how I understand it. I don't know how you can get around it. The history gives testimony to that. The verses in the Bible give testimony to that. So, in chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 5 is the only place in Revelation where Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. There are four places in Revelation where a lion is mentioned. Um, one is in Revelation 13, one of the characteristics of the composite beast that we know is the papacy. Um, it's not coming to my mind where the other lion is mentioned. Oh, it's one of the attributes of one of the cherubim. And then here in Revelation 5, 5, Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's only one other place where lion is mentioned in the book of Revelation. Where would that be? This is the the hardest presentation of the day because we're all digesting food and we're all comfortable. Where's the fourth place in the book of Revelation where a lion is addressed? Revelation 13, it's one of the attributes of the papacy. Um, it's one of the attributes of one of the cherubims. The cherubims have four faces, a lion, an ox, a man, and uh, an eagle. The lion of the tribe of Judah here in Revelation 5.5. 5, but where's the other place in the book of Revelation where a lion is mentioned? Re Revelation chapter 10. The mighty angel that had come down and put his foot upon the sea and the land, he cried as what? As a lion. See, in, the, in this history that's illustrated by the seven thunders, it was the crying out of this mighty angel who we know is Christ, and we know the line of the tribe of Judah is Christ too. It was his crying out that brought about the events that are symbolized by the seven thunders. How were those events brought out? Because he unsealed the book of Daniel. In Revelation 5.5, 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, have prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So what I'm suggesting to you here, is, among other things, is that at every revival and reformation that has taken place in sacred history, 
there has been an unfolding of God's word as part of the process of bringing God's people to revival. Every time. And the, the one that takes credit for unsealing the truths of the Bible is Jesus Christ. He's specifically identified as the one that unseals these truths. Now, as I said, in Adventism, by and large, the book that is sealed with seven seals in Revelation chapter 5 is understood to be a history book. And it is that, but it's, it's in a secondary sense. The book that is sealed with seven seals is the Bible. So let, let's nail that down first. Um, page 63, the sacred volumes. What are the sacred volumes? When Christ came to this earth, the traditions that had been handed down from generation to generation, and the human interpretation of scriptures hid from men the truth as it is in Jesus. The truth was buried beneath a mass of tradition. The spiritual import of the sacred volumes was lost. What are these sacred volumes? By context, what is she talking about here? The Bible. The sacred volumes. The spiritual significance of this had been lost. Everyone agree with that? Let's read on. For in their unbelief, men locked the door of the heavenly treasure. Darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people. Truth looked down from heaven to earth, but nowhere was revealed the divine impress. A gloom like a pall of death overspread the earth, but the line of the tribe of Judah prevailed. He opened the seal that closed the book of divine instruction. When the line of the tribe of Judah in chapter 5 comes to God the Father who's seated upon the throne and takes the book that's in God the Father's hand that is sealed with seven seals and the line of the tribe of Judah takes that book, that book is the Bible and it is sealed up. It's sealed up with seven seals. What are the seven seals? What are the seven seals that sealed the Bible? We just read it. It's always the same. God says of himself, I am God, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. What seals up the Bible? Traditions. Yes, traditions that have been handed down from gener generation to generation. We just read it. Human interpretations of scriptures. The truth was buried beneath a mass of tradition. So in the second paragraph, but the lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed. He opened the seal that closed the book of divine instruction. The world was permitted to gaze upon pure, unadulterated truth, truth that itself descended to roll back the darkness and counteract the air. A teacher was sent from heaven with the light that was to light every man that comes into the world. There were men and women who were eagerly seeking for knowledge, the sure word of prophecy, and when it came, it was as a light shining in a dark place. Brothers and sisters, the book of Daniel had been sealed up prior to the Millerite time period from human traditions and customs that had been handed down from generation to generation. And you can also add to that the Dark Ages, where there was a warfare carried out against the Bible. You can only find a Bible inside a, a Catholic church, and it's chained up there. But in the meantime, the only thing that was being taught about the Bible during that time period was human traditions and customs. And the, the truth of God's word had become sealed. Why is it that as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't understand the history of the pioneer time period or the truths that are illustrated on this chart? Now, some of you came in er later, but we read a quote earlier, and this is for all of us, not just for you, but you have it in your notes. Sister White says, we have no new message we are to continue to present the truths that brought the people out of the churches in 1843 and 1844. Sister White says, this is our message. And when you find that in your notes, right underneath it, you have a quote from Early Writings, page 74, where she says, I was shown that this chart, the 1843 chart, was directed by the hand of the Lord. Yet, here at the end of the world, Anybody prepared to give a Bible study on that for 2520 to a non-Adventist? How about uh, this one? You prepared to give a Bible study on the 1335? Raise your hand if you are. How about the 1290? How about uh, these dates here? Can you explain to a non-Adventist what 1299 is? How about 1449? Go ahead. Have you just told us that tradition 
is what's holding us back today, and I assume that's what you're trying to break? No, sort of, but no. What, I'm, what we're dealing with here is something more specific. What we're dealing with here, and, I, and I th hopefully those that have been here all morning underst understand this already. I've, I've put some precedent in place for this, is that in Revelation 10, verse 4, the seven thunders had just sounded, and then John is told, seal up with the seven thunders uttered. And when Sister White comments on that, she says the seven thunders represent two things. She says it represents the history that took place in the first and second angel's message from 1840 to 1844, but she says it also re represents future events that will be disclosed in their order. So we've looked at at least five places in the Bible that teach that this history of the Millerite time period is repeated at the end of the world to the very letter. How many have been here for all the presentation? Have you heard, have you seen those lines of prophecy illustrated for some of the people who just newly came? That's what we're dealing with. And so in verse 4 of Revelation 10, when the seven thunders were sealed up, the point we're making is this. The Millerite time period is going to be repeated at the end of the world. And what was sealed up for the Millerite time period was the book of Daniel. But here at the end of the world, what was sealed up is this history and this message. And in Revelation 22, 11, where Christ, where human probation closes, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. The verse before that says, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And the only prophecy in the book of Revelation that was sealed up is Revelation 10, 4. That's the only prophecy. So therefore, when this history is repeated at the end, the book that is unsealed for the 144,000 isn't the book of Daniel. It's verse 4 of Revelation 10, the seven thunders, which is identifying the history of the Millerite time period as the illustration of what takes place for the 144,000 at the end. And we're at the point now where we're trying to emphasize that when this unsealing takes place, we need to understand that it is the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, that is the one that is unsealing this. In other words, we need to take this very, very seriously. We, if it's error, it needs to be rejected. But brothers and sisters, if you can't prove that it's error, you have to receive this because this is being sent to your conscience, not by me, but by the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's how you have to relate to it. So, one more, uh, you may not be, realize it in Adventism, by and large, we believe the book that is sealed up in Revelation 5 is a history book. We need to understand that it is the Bible. It is the Bible. When was the book of Daniel sealed up? Just, a, just out, out of a curiosity. I mean, we teach, we teach, I shouldn't go there, but I'm going to, I already opened the door. Go there very quickly. In the Millerite time period, the book of Daniel was unsealed, right? Correct? We all understand that. When was the book of Daniel sealed up? In Daniel's day, was it? Turn to uh, Daniel chapter 9. Look at verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. What, are, what is this 70 weeks? This is a time period of the last time period of probation for ancient Israel, right? Came to a conclusion when? A.D. 34? A.D. 34, stoning of Stephen. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy pit, people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. In this last week of these 70 weeks, Christ accomplishes those four things at the cross, and by his life and at the cross. And then it says, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The vision was sealed up in AD 34, and it was unsealed in the time of the end, in the Millerite time period. The vision was sealed up in, in the time period of the, the, con the conclusion of the history of ancient Israel. And the message that was sealed up for the 144,000 was sealed up in the conclusion of the time period of 1840 to 44.
and we move from the Philadelphian to the Laodicean experience. And as one tradition and custom was handed down from one Adventist to another Adventist, we've reached the end of the world where we no longer understand these concepts that were established here as the foundation of Adventism. Brothers and sisters, if we're not to preach any other message, if this is our message, it stands the reason that we should understand this chart that was directed by the hand of the Lord. We don't. This is just one way to illustrate that it has been sealed up to our understanding. Not simply the message, but everything connected to that history. Anyway, middle of the page 63, the divine utterances. Again, we ask John, what of Christ? We hear the testimony of Isaiah. We ask John what he saw and heard in the vision of Patmos, and he answers, and he quotes Revelation 5, 1 through 3. There in his open hand lay the book, the roll of the history of God's providence, the prophetic histories of nation and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances. People take the first sentence there and say, oh, it's the the history of the world, and they just won't follow through to the next sentence, which says, it's the book that contains the divine utterances. Where are the divine utterances? It's the Bible. And does the Bible include within it the history of all nations and all mankind? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And you'll notice she goes on in the next paragraph, she is talking about Revelation 5, where the line of tribe of Judah is unsealing this. She says, the roll was wit- written within and without. John says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. The vision as presented to John made its impression upon his mind. The destiny of every nation was contained in that book. John was distressed at the utter inability of any human being or angelic intelligence to read the words or even to look there- thereon. His soul was wrought up to such a point of agony and suspense that one of the strong angels had compassion on him and laying his hand on him assuringly said, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals therein. So when you read this next quote and you begin to understand who the lion of the tribe of Judah is, it says from Selected Messages Book 2, All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to his students of prophecy the book of Daniel. That right here, in the Millerite time period. And thus Daniel is standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that's which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events which we must know as we stand on the threshold of their fulfillment. In history and prophecy, the word of God portrays the long continued conflict between truth and error. The conflict is yet in progress. Then notice what she says. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived and new theories will be continually arising. But God's people, who in their belief and fulfillment of prophecy have acted a part in the proclamation of the first and second and third angels' messages, know where they stand. They have an experience that is more precious than fine gold. They are to stand firm as a rock, holding the beginning of their confidence steadfast to the end. Where is the beginning of confidence for Adventism? It's right here, brothers and sisters, on this chart, in this history. This is the old past that we're to seek One of the works of God's people is Isaiah 58. And the work in Isaiah 58 is that those people that fulfill Isaiah 58 restore the paths to dwell in. The old paths, the old ways. This is happening. A transforming power attended the proclamation of the first and second angels' messages as it attends the message of the third angels. Lasting convictions were made upon human minds. The power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. There was diligent study of scriptures point by point. Almost entire nights were devoted to earnest searching of the word. We searched for the truth as for hidden treasure. The Lord revealed himself to us. Light was shed on the prophecies. And we knew that we received divine instruction. At lunchtime, we had our wrangling going on. Do we do, I actually had a suggestion, do we do two more presentations today, three more, or four more as the program? 
stated. And I understand the logic of it all, and I'm, I get just as weary as everyone else. But did you realize what she just said? Almost entire nights were devoted to earnest searching of the word. Why? Because they were Philadelphians. And Laodiceans, we know that at lunchtime on Sabbath, it's, it's time to go relax. It's time to get some rest in. And that's where we're at. That's a reality. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm, I'm really not. I'm not trying to criticize anyone. Anyway. And this is reality where we're at. We're, par- we're going to parallel this history. But one of the works that we have to do that they didn't have to do is we have to shake off the Laodicean experience that we've absorbed in our time period in Adventism and in the world. So, Amen. Amen. So next, next, uh, Revelation 10. I mentioned this earlier, but never made no points on it. Uh, verses 3 and 4. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered his voices. There's a cause and effect relationship here in these verses. The lion cries out, and who's the lion? It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah in the scriptures, he is portraying his work to reveal truths of God's word that have been sealed up through traditions and customs that have been handed down from generation to generation. So when he cries out, that's the cause. And the effect in these verses is after he cried, the seven thunders uttered their voices. And the seven thunders we've already established are the events that took place in this history. So when Christ cries out again, when the lion cries out again at the end of the world, these seven thunders, this history, these events will begin to unfold. And when did he cry out? Nineteen eighty nine. The events are underway. The events have already begun to take place again. And you'll see a quote here on reasoning from cause to effect. Seventh-day Adventists, students of prophecy, should be able to reason from cause to effect. One of the discussions you always have, it, it, we, I always come across, I don't know that everyone always has this when you're studying Bible prophecy, is, is the daily in the book of Daniel. And if we, would, if we would reason from cause to effect, brothers and sisters, early writings, page 74, Sister White says, the men that gave the judgment hour cry had the correct view of the daily. For a simple-minded person like me, that's all I need. Sister White says, the men that gave the judgment hour cry, they were correct on the daily. All I have to do now is go see what the man that gave the judgment hour cry believed about the daily, and it settled for me. And you go back and you find that William Miller and Joseph Bate and James White and Loughborough and Andrews, all those men, all of them, believed that the daily represented paganism. But today in Adventism, we teach that the daily represents the work that Christ does in the sanctuary above. So what I'm saying is when you come to a question like this, here we are at the end of the world, and we realize that there's truths that have been sealed up through traditions and customs that have been handed down from generation to generation, and we have to decide between the daily being a a work of Satan or a work of Christ, paganism, or the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, we need to figure this one out then one of the the tools that we should use to figure it out is to reason from cause to effect. Let me show you something very quickly. It's off the subject. Turn to, if you would, to to Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 8, there's ten times you'll find the word vision in Daniel chapter 8. But it's two Hebrew words that are translated as vision. Now, we have much to say about this as the other meetings proceed. We're going to talk briefly about the daily here and there, but I, w- I want to emphasize cause to effect, if you're going to just reason to cause to effect. One of these Hebrew words that is translated is, as uh, vision is mare, and one of them is chazon. Chazon means the complete vision, total vision. Mare means snapshot in terms of a, uh, of a, uh, a DVD. 
the Chazon DVD is the DVD presentation from the beginning to the end. But the Mare DVD is one slide, one picture. In fact, if you look at verse, um, give you an example of this, verse 17, 15. Verse 15, this word Mare in verse 15 is not translated as vision. It's translated as appearance, but it's still the same word. At the very last phrase of verse 15, it says, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. This word Mare means a singular snapshot illustration, okay? Follow me? Whereas Chao Zan means the entire vision. In verse 26, verse 26 says, has the word vision twice in it in your King James. It says, and the vision of the evening and morn which, morning which was told you is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. That's both those words. The vision of the evening and morning is the mare. Whereas the vision that is for many days is the chazon. What that verse is saying, the evenings and the mornings, is a direct connection to Daniel 8.14. Unto 2300 evenings and mornings. That's the actual Hebrew. Verse 26 is saying, the snapshot vision of Daniel 8.14 is true, but shut up the complete vision of Daniel chapter 8. The complete vision of Daniel chapter 8 is the vision that begins with the Medes and the Persians, to the Greeks, to the Romans, to the end. That's the complete vision. That's what the Hebrew means. Okay? Follow me? That, there's more to be said about these two visions. But do you follow the difference between those two words? Okay, let me show you something. What's the foundational verse for Adventism? Daniel 8.14. And what is Daniel 8.14? You can't answer because you haven't the slightest idea what I've tried to get at. It's the answer, isn't it? Daniel 8.14 is the answer to the question of verse 13, correct? Isn't that correct? Isn't that how we understand it? What's the question? Verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under the foot? The answer is 1844. Unto 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's the answer. But the question is, how long? The question is defining um, a duration of time. The question isn't when. The question is not when. When would be looking for a point in time, right? But how long is asking about a duration of time, correct? Everyone that understands the distinction, say amen. So the question is about duration of time. We know what the answer is. What's the answer? 1844. Okay, so the question is this, how long will be the complete vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? Now, the next part of the verse just tells what the daily and the transgression of desolation is going to do. They're going to trample the sanctuary and the host underfoot. Let's just disregard that. It's not the point at this point. It's the complete vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. So the question is this. How long is the complete vision of the daily? Do you all follow me on this logic? That's the question. How long is the complete vision of the daily in the transgression of desolation? In Adventism today, we teach that the daily represents the work of Christ in the sanctuary above that was removed or taken away by the introduction of the Mass by the Catholic Church. That's the teaching. That's a false teaching. That's not what the pioneer taught, but, but let me show you why it's a false teaching. Very simply, we'll reason from cause to effect. The only theologian that I've come across, there may be others, that says that the, the mass was introduced in history by the year 300 is a man named Samuel Bakioki. Most theologians say the mass came into history even after the year 300. The earliest I've ever seen is Bakioki says it came into history in the year 300. But let's disregard the historical part of it. 
the daily, according to the view we have in Adventism today, is the work of the Catholic Church of obscuring and removing the understanding of Christ's work in the sanctuary above. Through the introduction of the Mass. So, so if you're going to find out when this took place, you can go back if you want to quote Baiochi to the year 300, but not, let's not go that direction. Let's just ask the question, when did Christ begin his work in the in this heavenly sanctuary as the high priest? When was that? When? Yeah, that's correct. When was that? 31? Okay, so we're, we're, we're going to disregard the Mass. We're going to say Christ began his work in the sanctuary. We're going to give everyone the bed on the fin of the doubt. Now, what's the question? How long is the complete vision about the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary being removed, and the earliest point in time that you can start this vision is 31, the year 31, which means if you add 2,300 years to that, the judgment doesn't begin until a couple hundred more years from now. If you don't have the right understanding of the daily, brothers and sisters, you destroy the 2,300 days, the foundation of Adventism. But if you retain the pioneer position that the daily represented the work of paganism in trampling down the sanctuary and God's people, and the question is how long is the complete vision, which in Daniel 8 began when? When does the vision of Daniel 8 begin? Well, actually, he received the vision in the very final times of, of, of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, but the vision itself begins in the time period of the Medes and the Persians. So when the pioneers and William Miller said the beginning of this 2300-day prophecy was back here in the year 457, and the question is, how long is the complete vision concerning paganism trampling down the sanctuary in the host and papalism tra trampling down the sanctuary in the host? The question is about duration then the pioneer's understanding of the daily is absolutely sound. If you reason from con cause to effect, the earliest that you can say that Christ's work in the sanctuary was removed by anyone would be when he started his work in the sanctuary. And if that's the starting point for the 2,300 years, 1844 is destroyed. Follow the reasoning? That's reasoning from cause to effect. On questions, you have to write them down so we can get, get uh, the tape recorded on tape. If you've got a brief question, fire away. You didn't know that until right now. Now you do. Uh, does this time period you just explained also parallel with times of the Gentiles? Times of the Gentiles. Um, Absolutely. I have an understanding of the times of the Gentiles. It's not widely understood in Adventism. The, the views of the times of the Gentiles generally in Adventism are incorrect. The time of the Gentiles began in A.D. 34 at the stoning of Stephen, and it came to end either in 1798 or 1844, the time of the end, however you want to put it. Uh, I can see the argument for 1798, but the time of the Gentiles is the period of time between ancient Israel and modern Israel. It's the time period when there was no denominated people of God. And during that time period, uh, when Sister White's speaking of the 2300 years in the Great Controversy, she says every specification of the 2300 day prophecy was perfectly fulfilled. And she says that in 1834, the gospel was given to the Gentiles. That was one of the specifications of the 2300 day prophecy. And then she says from AD 34 to 1844 was 1810 years. So the logic of her statement is, is at the time of the Gentiles, took place from the stoning of Stephen when the gospel went to the Gentiles until once again God raised up a denominated people on October 22nd, 1844 in fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. And that is something that we don't know any longer. We don't understand this history. How many of you have heard a sermon recently on why we are God's denominated people? <laughs> Sister White says the reasons why we are God's denominated people should be repeated and repeated. That's word for word. Yet we don't hear that. And that's part of the understanding of the time of the Gentiles. It's way off our subject. But let's, let's get, I'm the one that got us off our subject. So 
no criticism for anyone but myself. Um, back to page 65. Um, we're to reason from cause to effect when it comes to Bible prophecy. And the reason I went there is just on, on, right there is an example that if we would reason to, from cause to effect, we would realize that the understanding of the daily that's taught in Adventism today destroys the foundation of Adventism. Just from the words vision. There are other reasons that you can show that that is incorrect as well, the daily, position of the daily, but that's reasoning from cause to effect. Jesus cried out as a lion. He he unsealed the truths of the book of Daniel and brought this experience of the Millerite movement. And in our day and age, he is unsealing um, the message that was sealed up in the seven thunders. And at the bottom of page um, 65, let's read this. I usually refer to verses 10 and 11 of Revelation 22, but now you have a background to really see what's being discussed here in Revelation 22 in a wider sense. We're, we started this presentation by emphasizing that the one characteristic that Jesus identifies about himself more than any other in Revelation chapter 1 is that he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus illustrates the end of things with the beginning of things. He does it in a variety of ways. So, and he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must sh shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, jo John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. He fell down to worship before who? Who did he fall down before? I would think this is Gabriel. Gabriel. Because Gabriel isn't here doesn't say, I'm Christ. He says, I'm one of the fellow servants. He says, then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of, these book, of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And we, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. What's he emphasizing here? He's emphasizing once again that he portrays the end from the beginning. And in the beginning of Adventism, there was a book that was unsealed by the line of the tribe of Judah that brought about the purifying process and the events that are illustrated in the seven thunders, the parable of the ten virgins, and that point forward to the events in the purification experience of the 144,000. And brothers and sisters, when you reach the point in Earth's history, when you begin to understand what the seven thunders represent, it means beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is unsealing these truths here and now and probation is about to close. That's what it means. And that's how he, that's how he does unseal his word. When he unseals his word, he illustrates the conclusion with the start. That's who he is. This is what proves that he is God. So, the first angel's message, the message of the hour, Daniel 8, 14. Um, the type of message, you'll see a quote there, one of many where Sister White emphasizes this. Four characteristics that she associates with William Miller's message, message of reform, message of preparation, uh, an arousal message or awakening and uh, reform, arousal, warning, and preparation. It was based upon the, the book of Daniel. William Miller was announcing that judgment is beginning. Okay? And judgment is beginning. When fulfilled, the judgment of the dead begins. 1844, October 22nd, the judgment began and it began with the dead. Judgment of the dead begins. It was given in the time period of Philadelphia, 
a mighty angel comes down, August 11th, 1840, the mighty angel of Revelation 10.1, Christ came down to empower the first angel's message. Empo it's empowered when a power of Bible prophecy from, from the bottomless pit collapses Islam in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, Revelation 9.15. The midnight cry, the midnight cry is the light, brothers and sisters, that lights what? It lights the path to heaven. It was the bright light that was set up at the beginning of Adventism, but the midnight cry of, among the truths of this history, the one that is pointed out in Scripture that lights the path all the way to the end is the characteristics associated with the midnight cry. You remember when we read that quote? We're familiar with that quote in Adventism anyway. So what was the midnight cry? We have it quoted there in Matthew 25. Here's Great Controversy, we're on page 67. Page 398, 399 of Great Controversy says, that which led to this movement, the movement of the midnight cry, was the discovery that the decree of Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem, which formed the starting point for the period of the 2300 days, went into effect in the autumn of the year 457 and not at the beginning of the year, as had for been formerly believed, reckoning from the autumn of 457. The 2300 years would terminate in the autumn of 1844. And then she goes on to explain how they arrive at October 22nd. But here's my point, brothers and sisters. We just read it. And you can go back and analyze this for yourself. This is what brought about the midnight cry from August 12th to August 17th at a camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire. They discovered the starting point for the 2300 days. And as they did further study, it allowed them to not only say that the 2300-year prophecy ended in 1844, but that it ended on October 22, 1844. And when they knew that, in 61 or 63 days, they took the message from Exeter, New Hampshire, across the United States like a tidal wave. The Holy Spirit was poured out. Could we leave here today? Could we leave here today and... and in our human power, sh if, share any message, any message we want to say, okay, this is the one we're going to try to send around the United States in 66 days. Yeah, I guess we could if we got on the Internet. People wouldn't understand it probably, but you could do it today. But how could they do that in 66 days, 63 days, whatever it is? Count it, October 17th to October, August 17th to October 22nd. It's just a couple months. Power of the Holy Spirit. What brought this about, brothers and sisters, was this. It was new light. New prophetic light. On the very message of the hour. What was the message? Under 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That was the message. It was new light directly connected to the message. One other point. When the new light arrived in history, the new light calculated October 22nd, 1844. Correct? That's what they calculated with the new light. When that arrived in history, the door closed. That's the characteristics of the midnight cry. You follow, you follow the logic. The message was Daniel 8.14. The new light that brought about the midnight cry was identifying the starting point for that prophecy. So it was directly connected to the message of the hour. And when it arrived in history, when it was fulfilled, the door closed in the church of Philadelphia. The door closed in the parable of the ten virgins. And the door closed on the Millerite movement. Right? So, this is going to be repeated again to the very letter. The truth that will bring the midnight cry at the end will have to have the same characteristics because this history is repeated to the very letter. Right? That's what we've been studying all day long. Now what we're saying, third angel's message began here, October 22nd, 1844. This is our message. Our message is the third angel's message. William Miller's message was Daniel 8.14, correct? There are similarities between this time period, but some of the similarities have a little bit of differences in them, correct? So his message is Daniel 8.14. Our message began 1844. Third angel's message. His message begins 1831, 1833 time period. 
But on August 11, 1840, it's empowered by the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. First angel's message comes into history. First angel's message is a message that goes to the entire world. Second angel's message is primarily fulfilled in the United States. That's what she says. And during the second angel's message, the midnight cry is poured out. So during the history that parallels that at the end, it's where you look for the loud cry or the latter rain. Our message is the third angel's message comes a point in time when Christ is going to empower this message. And the empowerment of the third angel's message is done by the fourth angel of Revelation 18. But the fourth angel of Revelation 18 has two parts, remember? The angel comes down from heaven and lightens the earth with his glory. And then John hears another voice. The angel that came down to empower the third angel's message, which is our message, the message that came down was Daniel 11, verse 40, which identified the collapse of a power in Bible prophecy that came out of the bottomless pit. Back then it was Islam. Here it's atheism. The parallel is identical. The next verse, verse 41, describes a Sunday law in the United States, at which time the latter rain is poured out. The loud cry message goes forth of the fourth angel's message, part two kicks in, and probation closes progressively, just like it did back then. Brothers and sisters, the new light on the message of the hour, message of the hour is the third angel's message, a warning against receiving the mark of the beast, is verse 41 of Daniel 11, which is identifying that the next things to happen in Bible prophecy is a Sunday law, new light, directly connected to the very message of the hour. And when the Sunday law arrives, the door of probation closes upon Adventism and then the rest of mankind. We just have a couple minutes, right? Seven and a half minutes. Seven and a half minutes. <clears throat> the message of the hour in terms of understanding what's taking place on planet earth today is the last six verses of Daniel 11 that's how I understand it it's the message that the line of the tribe of Judah is unsealing before mankind right now along with this history and it, it occurs in Earth's history in the time period of Laodicea, not in the time period of Philadelphia. It occurs in a period of history where most of God's people would rather sleep on than be awakened. And those that want to awaken to the truth of this message are going to find that the majority of the Advent family around them, in one way or another, is going to war against this message. That's what happened in this time period. That was the purification process. Nothing new under the sun. Brothers and sisters, what you've been hearing today was emphasizing the repeat of that history in our day and age and drawing at least a partial connection with the very message that fulfills uh, the unsealing, Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And we believe that Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is identifying how the papacy once again takes control of the planet Earth. And we believe also that that truth of how the papacy takes control of the world at the end of time has been illustrated with the history of when the papacy took control of planet Earth the first time around. Because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And that's, that's where we're going to start with our next studies is going that direction. And that's where the daily suddenly is something that you have to deal with because the daily has been identified by Sister White as part of the history that prefigures the last six verses of Daniel 11. And suddenly we need to be sure what that history represents. Shall we pray?
Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bring an awareness to the fact that it is you that is trying to warn us that you are at the point in time in history where you are unsealing truths that have been especially prepared for your people at the end of the world. We want to understand not these truths alone, but the fact that it is you that are the one that is unfolding them to our hearts and our minds. And let this reality be a tool in your hand, a tool in the hands of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction upon us that we need to prepare for what's about ta to take place on planet Earth. We ask that as this day continues, you do continue to guide and direct and bless, and we thank you for all that you've done so far. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>